All right, so I'm excited. I got Brian Stahl here with me today. He uh, is the owner of Fidelis Mortgage out in Pennsylvania. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Brian. Really, really appreciate it. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, man. So, um, so Brian has come through one of our programs called Man Wealth Immersion and, uh, and, and also our Circle of Champions program. And, and so I've gotten to know him pretty well over the last, I don't know, three to four months, I suppose, and asked him to be on the Championship Leadership Podcast because he uh, has a lot of experience. He was uh, a Marine. He worked inside of the prison system as a prison guard and uh, took himself from... I guess you'd say the bottom to, to where he is today, very successful to the top. And uh, just so much experience that I wanna get into here today with you, Brian. So first question off is the name of the podcast is Championship Leadership. What do you think of what, what comes to mind for you when you hear Championship Leadership? Because it's not a term that really has ever been until I, I came up with it, or actually a yeah. friend of mine came up with it for me. Um, that I've heard of before. So yeah, what do you think of or what's present for you when you hear that? You know, it's funny, you get, you get asked oftentimes, what's the one thing? You know, everyone wants to ask you the one yeah. thing. You can yeah. pick it. And I, I never answer that question because to me, like if you, if you use the term championship leadership and you like, you look up into the sky when it's dark and you see all these thousands of stars and then uh, really what it is, it's, to me, it's like an ecosystem to where one thing that maybe hundreds of thousands of miles from something else can be affected. Uh, so it's really looking at the big picture rising so far above, you know, not just a 10,000 foot view of either your business or your relationship or whatever you want to call, whatever you want to talk about leadership. It's, it's being able to be, um, to see the future kind of in your business and being prepared for the lean times, being prepared for the sacrifice, being intuitive, uh, being uncommon. Uh, I truly believe when everybody's doing something, I kind of jump on the other side and go against the grain because usually that's the easy way out when everybody's doing something. When you, so when I, I listened to a few of your podcasts before and said championship leadership, you know, there's always a leader of the leaders at the, at the end of the day. And if I were to say directly to, to your phrase, it almost encompasses everything. And we could, we could sit here and talk about each subject of leadership. And it's not just one, it's just not two, it's not just three, it's a multitude. It's, being, it's really being the teacher, a student, all at the same time. Yes. And, and continually growing that way. So. You know, I'm a sponge. So anytime I can get next to someone to learn, to hear, I was sitting next to General Patton's grandson the other day. I didn't know it till halfway. <laughs> and once exciting. I figured it out, I was like, he was probably like, get the hell away from me. <laughs> I asked him so many questions. Uh, you know, and here he was the founder of Crocs. So it's, it's always keeping your head on a swivel. Uh, you know, we can get a lot more detail, but from a general yeah. thing, it's yeah. a, a big ecosystem when it comes to business and there's so many touch points in championship leadership. I love it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, general Patton, uh, definitely a championship leader. Right. And, uh, that's pretty incredible to, to run into his grandson and, and I'm yeah. sure you were able to, uh, ask I wanted to ask for ID, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to believe. Yeah. yeah right. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you didn't verify it. <laughs> no, didn't verify it. It's it yeah. unverified setting of General Patton's uh, grandson. Yeah, absolutely. I love it, man. And uh, I agree. Yeah. You know, when it really comes down to it, when you're trying to define what a leader is, you can, you can get into all the characteristics and everything. But like I said, ultimately what leaders do is they lead. So, yeah. um, and there's, there's so many different ways that you can lead and that people do lead. And, uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. Maybe get into your story. I know we were talking offline here a little bit before yeah. about your story and where you've come from. Um, but yeah, like how did you get to where you are today? <laughs> You're married. You got uh, two yeah. kids, one on the way, yeah. and uh, you have a very successful business. Um, but yeah, it didn't start out that way. 
No. No, I'm actually writing a book that doesn't have a title on it. Okay. Yet. Um, he's going to talk about, you know, I was a shy kid back in the day. I don't think I wore shorts till I was 17 from people uh, making fun of me how skinny my legs were. Oh, really? Well, I let so many people affect me. But I had little tiny hints of leadership from being like the captain of the basketball team. Yeah. And I performed very well athletically back then. Uh, so I had no clue my path was going to be business. My path was going to be attracting people, leading people. And uh, I always loved law enforcement. I did. I used to watch those, uh, what was it? Dukes of hazard. Yeah. Going at you know, the cops in there, all the, the a team, like all that stuff. So, you know, me and my friends, we'd always been playing cops and robbers on the street. And luckily I decided to be a cop. Okay. Not a robber. And I went to the Marine Corps as a military police officer. I went to college for criminology. And when I got out in between, you know, I was, I was buying drugs undercover in uh, South Carolina. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, at my, my grandfather ho- owned a motel. Highlight the word motel, not motel. motel. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. So I was yeah. trying to clean it up. Didn't really realize the risk I was taking at the moment. Yeah. But, yeah. And, I was my dream. I want DEA, FBI. I was applying to all those things. Okay. And you take a test that doesn't really have the right answers in the test. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, the physical stuff, boom, you know, I, I could run a 450 mile back then. Like yeah. that, that was no problem, but I wasn't passing these tests. And a funny, quick, funny joke. Um, I took the state police tests and I got the results back and it said I was 15th. I go, you gotta be kidding me. That's like out of thousands of people. I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. Well, two weeks later, it says, we're sorry, you were 15th, but you were tied with like 2,000 other people at 15th. Oh, wow. And my hopes got dashed. So I saw an ad in the paper for prison guard at a maximum security prison. I was like, well, I got to get some experience. So I went and got the job and it paid at that point $10.50 an hour. Yeah. I was walking people back from being, being convicted to put on death row, gangbangers, um, murders, rapists, burglaries, everything for $10 and 50 cents an hour. And I did that for about two years and I won't get into all of the story. I'm sure there's a ton, right? Uh, yeah. There's a ton going with that, but my leap from law enforcement to business ended up, um, being a possibility through an iron door. So when you're in a prison, yeah. it, it's a big iron door with a small wicker hole at the bottom. And I met an inmate. I don't want to spill all that for the book, but I met an inmate that basically had some major issues and was causing a lot of problems Yeah. that I listened to a few things he said and down the road, they weren't lies. And when I opened up those doors, it led me into a whole business world. So, you know, that's one thing I always talk about. Be careful who you turn a meeting down with Yeah. because those meetings could turn into something that would just blow your mind. That meeting turned into me having a $5 million business to being able to, you know, give to charities to help people. It creates options and opportunities. Uh, It was a long road, uh, still learning every day, but we have a nice small, you know, small business and uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Like you said, and and well, you just mentioned like the, the business that you've been able to build and give it back uh, that made me think, by the way, um, I'm running 200 miles coming up here in April. And for my listeners, I don't think I've, I've, I've mentioned this April 4th through the 7th, yeah. uh, 2019. So if you're listening to this down the road uh, here in 2019, in just a few weeks, actually, I'll be going to run 200 miles and raising some money for a local charity and Fidelis Mortgage and, and yourself. Thank you so much. You're donating uh, five thousand to to that cause, and and uh, oh, yeah. really appreciate that. So I just want to to acknowledge that and recognize you here on the show as well. So thank you for that. But that's the least we could do for putting yourself through two hundred miles. <laughs> I know it, man. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things that. Well, I mean, it it sounds cool, but it kind of doesn't. Um, but when I get in it, I'm gonna you're gonna realize real quick how. Um, how 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 uh, challenging it's going to be. Let's just put it that way. And, you know what's uh, great about you doing this 200 miles is I signed up for a 33 mile race and I thought that was death. And then whenever yeah. I'm thinking about it, I say Nate's doing 200. This is this is easy. Yeah, you got this. Right? 167 more miles. To go. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, even yeah. to get to 150 and, um, and man, to think that you still got 50 miles to go. Yeah. <laughs> we should stop talking about yeah, that. Let's not even think about that. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's come back to your story. So what, what year was that when you were uh, working in the prison? It was about 19, uh, I got out of college in 97, uh, about 1998, 99. So we're, we're approaching 20 years ago. Yeah, because I know we're, uh, yeah, we're, I think we're about the same age. And uh, I graduated in 94. You, maybe you graduated a little earlier than that. I graduated uh, college in 97. When, when did you graduate high school? Oh, 92. 92. Then you went straight to the Marines? 93, yeah. And then you what? And then you're in the Marines for what? Like My contract years? was from 93 to 99. Okay. Were you in reserves? Yep. For, for oh, okay. Part gotcha. Of so you were going to school at the same time then? Yeah. Okay. Clear. All right. And so, yeah, you, so you met somebody and, and it was actually a, uh, an inmate, right? Yeah. And, and he, he had a son that, that worked in the insurance business? He had a son that actually worked at the prison and then got into the insurance and investing business. Okay. That did really well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he ended up giving me a card of his son and I just respectfully took it in my back pocket, never called him and. A lot of crazy stuff happened at the prison. Yeah. You know, you witness guards being stabbed. Uh, yeah. Just a lot of different stuff. And it led me to say, you know what? Looking at myself in the mirror, like, what do you want in life? Like, yeah. I have no idea what I want. I have no idea what I was capable of making 20 some thousand dollars a year, being around, you know, like people with a lot of diseases, a lot of violence. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't that way 100% of the time. It's like, you know, 95%, it was calm. 5%, you were like, whoa. And uh, it just wasn't for me for the rest of my life. And that's what that moment took me from continuing to apply. Like I was, I think I was on my, got past my first round for New York City police. And I was in 99, then 01 happened. So I look back, a lot of small things changed my trajectory that uh, I'm just so happy that they did because I, I wouldn't have been happy in law enforcement for the rest of my life. It's not something I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I was just thinking about this yesterday as I was on a run training and, um, just thinking of some of the things that happened to me that had, I had those worked out, you know, I wouldn't be where I was today. And it's just like, man, it's just all for a reason for sure. And, uh, and it's just to stay on that path and stay true to you to what it is that you want, you know, and I think that's a big part of uh, great leaders. Again, we, we talk a little bit, you know, all leaders lead a different, a little bit differently, but uh, there's a lot of similarities as well. And, and great leaders are really, if they, like you said, you know, they're clear on what they want and uh, they're just in it for the long game, man. They're, yeah. they're in it. Like the, there's nothing that's going to stop them is I guess what I'm trying to say. So, who are some strong leaders that you've had in your life that have positively or maybe even not so positively affected your life and kind of put you on the trajectory of life that you're in? Yeah, uh, you know, I started seeking out and hiring mentors probably maybe four or five years ago. Uh huh. And uh, maybe even longer than that, 10 years ago. In the beginning, you know, the, they weren't the right fit. I was just sold. I think, I think the one mentor, I, I can only remember his, his, his best piece of advice to me was get a postcard and send it to everybody, you know, and have right on it. I really like you. And that, <laughs> that, uh, that was the best piece of advice. And I think I paid about 25 grand for that, you know, no. over, over a 12 month period. It was, did he, you do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> and he's still out there doing these kind of things, but Hey, that's, that's his gig. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, here's one of the things where we talk about, I'm going to answer your question from one of the things that I believe in leadership is you never stop moving because sometimes I will start something and I won't know. I don't know where my win is yet at the end of the day. I just believe what I'm starting is a great idea. And so I got connected to Ryan Stuman. Yeah. Years Ryan's ago. Been on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I got connected with Ryan and we hit it off. He's a great guy. Uh, I didn't know where my win was yet though, um, with what we were going to do. Yeah. And we, we met each other for probably a year's time. And then he connected me to 
three great people. One being you and Satema Gali, yep. which I think the information you guys provide at, at uh, Man Wealth and Immersion, it's so valuable in so many different aspects of life. Um, it's, it's really, it's more valuable than any psychology class I've taken in any university at the end of the day. Yeah, wow. And then, and then one of my favorite, and you guys are, are, are one of my favorites too. And then that led me to then David Goggins, which yeah. I'm also very proud to be connected to him as well because he doesn't take everybody. I mean, right now, I think I'm one of his last two, two students. So I'm currently working with you, Satema and David all at one time. Man, and, that's incredible. Yeah. And where that's bringing me up, it's almost like, you know, people, I've heard people say, ah, you know, if you, 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 we go over one of the lessons in man wealth and I hear people go, I knew that you know, I've heard those words before, but they've never applied it and understood how to do it in a systematic way. That makes sense that you keep track, you keep doing it. Um, and, and so those probably have been my three top, top mentors in my life that are helping drive my business, drive my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Like a quick example would be is when you come in, when you have somebody hostile coming at you that maybe just wasn't happy with your performance in the business, you have a couple choices at that moment. You could pull out a sword and fight them and there will be zero benefit that comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And, or you can take a bad situation and maybe they don't end up doing business with you, but they really love how you handled the situation and you don't get that bad, you don't get that bad review. You don't get that little black mark running around town telling everybody what you did. So leadership is also knowing when to, to lose on purpose. Yeah, yeah I love there's, that. There's a strategy to it. You don't go out there trying to win every single game. So there's sometimes where I'll say, you know what, I'm going to take an L on this because the win is five steps down the road. So these are the kind of things my mentors, um, David Goggins, you and Satema, we're putting, I'm putting all this together and it's, it's really helping me at the end of the day. Yeah. Where'd you learn, where, where'd you learn that? Um, or, or is that just something that you've kind of known? You, you know, I, you know, this is where I, it all starts back to when I was a kid. I realize that when I'm in a sandbox and I have all my toys and I go up to another kid and I tear the toy out of his hand. Yeah. He's not going to come back to play with me. And I, I, <laughs> right. like, I like the kid. Um, and then from basketball, I remember my neighbor, every single game, I would beat him 10 to zero, 10 to one. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you don't have anyone to play with. <laughs> yeah. And I could, I could see he was getting discouraged. So I started letting him get six, seven points. And yeah. then one time, I let him beat me and yeah. he rejoiced and he talked so much trash to me. Yeah. And I'm like, Damn, I should not let this kid beat me. Yeah. Next thing you know, he brought his friends over. We were all playing. Yeah. So you don't always, you know, it's about being humble, being quiet. Sometimes not, not thinking you just have to destroy everybody and everything. So I learned it back from when I was a kid till now. There's sometimes where I'll lose money on purpose. I, I know that sounds crazy to a lot of business owners, but I promise you, I have made times 10 by making those strategic moves at certain points. Yeah, that's a great point because when you're doing that, you're not really, you know that you're not, at that point, it's almost like you're not losing the money. It's, it's like, it's just an investment yeah. that you know that you're going to get back. Like you got to give a little to get more, right? Yeah. Yep. And uh, yeah, great leaders are able to see that because there's a lot of people out there that just, they don't have, the, it's not good or bad. It's just that they aren't able to see things that way, right? They just look at. They just grew up money. so. I thought of that money and like, oh my God, I can't do that. They just and, grew up so tight with their, with their money and they don't get, you know, the, like, here's a perfect thing when we talk about Ryan, Satana yeah. and Goggins. So when I met Ryan, I brought in Goggins for a, a speech and with Alan Belcher, a UFC fighter, I think the whole yep. event cost me 40 some grand. Yeah. And I was like, everyone was telling me, you crazy? Like, are you crazy? You're a small little company just dropping 40, 50 grand whenever you feel like it. And I said, this is going to work out. Well, how? I didn't have the answer yet. Yeah, you don't know, right? Well, a friend of mine called me that I met. He goes, I heard you're throwing this Goggins event on. He's from Dallas, Texas. I said, yeah, come on out. 
never thought he was going to come out. The, the guy books a flight. He's in my business. Was so impressed with what was put together. We start chatting. I circle back from Goggins to, to you guys to, to Stuman. That move right there, he signed on. He's on board. It's going to start out making me multiple six figures every year from the door. And this gentleman is so motivated. He has so many connections. Yeah. It's going to bring seven figures to my company in the next three years. And it just goes back to leadership of having that intuition yep. and connecting yourself with winners. Like, and, and I think I got this from you, so I won't steal this from you. I'll let everybody know this came from you. For most of my life, I was a five swimming in a sea of threes. Yeah. Thinking I was a 10 and, and I never pushed myself because I always made the most money. I was probably the, in the best, worst shape of all of us. Cause none of us were in good shape. My friends. Yeah. And when that hit me, I actually let most of my friends go and yeah. because they, they didn't drive me. They didn't help me. And now I'm, I'm a five or a six in a sea of eight or nines or tens. Yeah. And I always liked being one of the poorest guys in the room. Right. I always like being one of the least knowledgeable guys in the room. And I'm just, I'm after them. Like I'm chasing them around and they look around and they see me. There he is again. He just, yeah. I'm going to New York tomorrow. You know, I'm, ch- yeah. I'm all over the country chasing them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, you know, and championship level leaders are going to, they're going to surround themselves with like, if you're a five or a six with eight and nines. And uh, when you're, when you're in that environment, and you're a championship leader, like you're not going to stay a five or a six. You're going to be like, yeah. screw this. I'm like, I'm coming here. I come watch out because I'm going to be a nine or a 10. And then I'm going to have to uh, up level again and continue just down that path to grow. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's huge. And, and yeah, the fives in C of threes, and it's not <laughs> just financially, right? I mean, yeah. that's all areas where, you know, take, take a, take, take stock of where you're at. You know, Goggins calls it uh, the accountability mirror, right? Like look yourself in the mirror and take stock of your life and like, where are you really at? And yeah, maybe you're five physically, but you're a nine or a 10 financially and relationally you're seven or whatever. And uh, you know, cause you got to know what that baseline is. is you can know oh, yeah. where you have to go from there. Yeah. We didn't even, I mean, that's a whole nother topic, but you know, I know, I know people that have a hundred million dollars that are 80 pounds overweight. Oh yeah. I know people that work till, till two, 3 AM and have a horrible relationship. So you're right. Like, it, you know, it's not about things for me. It's not about the money. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's figuring out that balance and I'm not an expert at that. You know, every day is a new challenge. Every day is a new thought. Every day is, you know, something that you have to, to rationalize. So when you talk about championship leader, to me, it's like, I think we talked about it before. It's, it's like being Yoda, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, the, the, the wizard of Oz where you're just taking things and, and handling it properly. The one thing Goggin says to me every day, he goes, Brian, anytime you come into a situation, ask yourself, would a 45 year old man respond this way? Are you responding like a 45 year old adult man? Or yeah. are you getting emotional like a little kid and throwing <laughs> your toys down and have a temper tantrum because somebody questioned you, somebody disrespected you. Yeah. And I fail at that once in a while, but when you're conscious of that, yeah, you can rise to the occasion more times than you fail. And, and when I t- talk about um, your, your man, men's wealth and immersion, there's a level of psychology that you guys are implementing that, that, I told my wife, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not cheap to work with you guys. And and if it was cheap, it probably wouldn't have value. But my wife said, you know, do you think it's worth it? And I, I, I said, honey, like not, let's not just talk about only relationship wise. I go, I believe this kind of info and grasping it is worth a million dollars on the street in business. Oh, and, then, and then if you have a bad relationship, you're going to lose half that million anyway. So you better get it all right. <laughs> yeah. Right. No doubt. I love it. And yeah, your wife came through uh, our shield Maiden program. Pregnant. After I probably after that conversation. So she came through pregnant too. Yeah, she did, man. She was a uh, incredible woman. You, you are married to, she's so strong. She did. everything. Oh, like I got to admit something that's ba- embarrassing. 
She we, did a sport, we did a Spartan race not long ago. I was pregnant, like three months pregnant. Like yeah. Pregnant, pregnant. <laughs> well, here's something that's embarrassing. You know, we did a Spartan race together, and she suckered me so good. She's like, <laughs> let's just go slow. I'm going to walk it. And I'm out of shape. I'm just getting back into it. Yeah. It was a sprint. She takes off like a bat out of hell. She beats me in a Spartan race. And mind you, I would back in the, the day, I'd run a 450 mile. I'd run 17 minute, three miles. That was my thing. I was depressed. She beat me and she, I think she loved it. She didn't rub it in, but boy. So that's when after that, I said, oh no. She's sandbagging her athleticism and she's, 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 still, she's pregnant and still beating everybody. Dude, yeah, she's strong, man. And, yeah, that's funny. Uh, speaking of Spartan races, by the way, uh, Satama, myself, KT, Kenneth Travis, Sean yeah. Zolmanoff, a few other guys are doing a Spartan race in Colorado in July. You should join us, man. Oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah, check out the out. gauntlet. You coming? I'll check it out. Yeah, well, I'm I'll gonna check it out. I'm gonna, I'll, put a, I'll put a message in our chat. I know that's. Uh, I should be good. I'm going to be doing a 33 mile race before that, so I should be able to at least finish the. You'd be primed and ready, right? Yeah. It'd be a powerful group of leaders. And that's another thing, like, right. I mean, leaders. So I think of, I'm a football guy. Um, I think of Mike McCarthy, who was the Packers coach, um, Bill, Bill Belichick, Saban, all these great coaches. They're constantly surrounding themselves with other leaders in their industry. And I'm sure, I'm sure out of their industry as well. Um, because they know that they don't have it all figured out and they know that sometimes your message message can get stale, but also just to stay up because everything's changing all the time. The game of football, right? I mean, it changes almost every year, the offense, defense, you know, how the game is played, the players, the strength, their speed, their size, um, everything's constantly changing. And to stay on the top, they go out and they, they'll go to, <laughs> college programs and send the coaches there to learn they'll go wherever they have to so that they can continue to get better and so when i was talking about this this uh spartan it's like a bunch of great leaders in all areas very successful coming together um to continue to do life together to, to continue to grow and to learn from each other and to to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and I'm sure Goggins talks about that all the time, right? I mean, obviously he does inside of his book and his podcast. And, and uh, so I'm sure you get that message from him quite often. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think Zalmanoff is going to be the sleeper on that. I think he's going to win that. I think so, too. Yeah, he's uh... – KT can do a 31-minute plank. Yeah. And um, when I saw he did that, I was talking to him, and I said, I heard you also have the world record for Kegels since you concentrated yeah, I saw on the plank. That. <laughs> I saw that message. I, I laughed. Yeah, he's a good guy. We joke around. Yeah. Uh, no, great people. Um, so let's talk. You, t you mentioned in the, in the beginning or early on um, about how often people will go one, one direction and, and that's kind of a sign for you to usually go the opposite, right? To take that low, road less traveled, which I definitely agree is, is a, what a championship level leader will do. They're going, going right when everybody else is going left. Yep. And um, it's just uh, whether that's a learned thing or whether that's just something that's built inside of us. I think it's it maybe a little bit both. Maybe it's one or the other for some. But regardless, what's what's that time? And I'm sure you have a multiple times in your life when this has happened. But is there one maybe that really comes to mind where <laughs> had you gone left when everybody else was instead of right? like this, this big turning point in your life, you could be doing something completely different. You could be married to a different woman. You could be living somewhere else, like could have hugely altered your reality today. Like, is there a moment that really sticks out to you? There's, there's several. I mean, yeah. I'm focused on business right now. Okay. So I take a lot of principles from the military. Yeah. Being lean, light, and being able to move fast like a speedboat. Yeah. And back when the, the, the first, we'll call it recession. I think they were calling it recession slash depression back uh, when the housing market hit the fan. Yeah. You know, it has to do with your vantage point, your strategy and your tactics, and you have to think further ahead. So I, I know what goes up will come down all the time and what goes down will go up. If you look at the history of the economics in the United States, every five to seven years, you have some rolling hills and then sometimes you have some deep, deep cuts up and down. So the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure you're ready for when those rolling hills happen or the deep cuts. And I believe in, in cash is king, you know, having a lot of reserves at that point. 
So when I start seeing my competitors laying people off, firing people, taking their pricing up, I took the vantage point that when things were super, you know, like money was just flowing in, I stockpiled it because I know what was coming. And then when that kind of, th those kind of things happened, I doubled down on all my efforts. And while they're letting people go, we keep all our good people. I mean, they're letting some great people go. Right. Uh, we've never fired one person in the history of my existence for a downturn in uh, the economy. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. We, you know, and I think we have a group of leaders here because when that last happened, we all got together. I took the biggest pay cut and, and they kept their salaries, but they reduced their bonuses. And I was so appreciative of that during those times that when the good times came back, I gave some, I gave the leaders the money that they missed. Yeah. I wrote a check back to them. So it's, it's your vantage point and being prepared um, for when the downtime comes and then is being uncommon amongst the common. And what I mean by that is you know, so many people are right now, today's world, they're scared to be committed and do things consistently and persistent and put the money out into investing if it's not immediate gratification. So I believe in the, in the medium game, the long game, and knowing when to be persistent and when to push at these kind of things. So right now, the same thing is happening right now as we speak in my industry. Uh, we have companies, I think um, the big guys are leaving thousands of people go. I won't mention the names of the companies, yep. but they're, they're being left go. So we have started a project to where we're dumping a quarter million dollars in now to branding and getting, we're, we're a hyper, -lo, hyper local company. We're not nationwide. Yep. And, and we have people calling us. I'm like, you should have got in when we were hiring. Like we're actually on hiring freezes. We'll hire one or two people yeah. and, and then go on a hiring freeze and then go out and get new people. So it's all about your vantage point, what you, what you think is gonna happen, when is it gonna happen, your reserves, your strategy, tactics. Those things are all pivotal points because even though the market is going down, so many people leave, you invest at the right time, your market share actually goes up and you become even stronger. And one of the things that you can do as a business owner to help with that, I call it the spin. So whatever business you're in, there's multiple other layers in things that you can make money within your business yep. that, can, that actually helps the client. So for my business, it's pretty easy. You know? It's title insurance, it's homeowners insurance, it's alarm systems. So we've created partnerships with people that are better than the rest of the market and benefit our customers and we just present the product. Next thing you know, we have multiple layers of income coming in, building up those reserves while we take a big chunk of our reserves and attack the market while everybody's fleeting yeah. and we're driving down our prices even further. Yeah. And, and what, you know, that's just simply timing, yeah. vantage point and being ready for the next battle. And those are the kind of things I learned, you know, in the Marines and as, as life went on. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, that's like, uh, you know, in the military, in the army, it's all about contingencies and what could, you know, you're always thinking of what, yeah. could go wrong here so that you're not surprised and that's exactly what you're doing so when i heard you saying that i'm like man you got that in the marine corps for sure Absolutely. and uh, and yeah that's powerful and that is being uncommon for sure because there's not many out there that can say that they're doing that number one that that, that will have the cash to be prepared when those times do hit and then just that that vision what i like to call it's really this vision of, all right, everybody's firing and raising prices and just like locking up and you're ready to attack. You're, you're going to then in those lean times, it's like when everybody, when the stock market crashes, most people sell, right? Which is the worst time to sell yeah. because the prices are low and then they get back in when the prices are high. Because now they feel like, oh, the market's okay again. Well, you just screwed yourself. So you, it's almost the same exact strategy. You're, when the market is super low, you're, you're doubling down and you're putting more money in because you know that you're going to get that, that bigger percent of the market share. And, uh, and it's going to, you know, that money, it's just, it's going to compound. So Yeah, you're exactly right. And like another thing that I see business people get, like, get caught up in 
you know, and it has to do with their ego and the nice shiny stuff. Like if you came to my office right now, you probably wouldn't say it because you just wouldn't want to make me feel bad, but you would not be impressed. And when, when I tell clients and my business partners, if you see a chandelier coming in here with all this great artwork, guess who's paying for that? Yeah. You. Yeah. And, and if you go back to the military mindset, you know, I go lean, humble. So we have a four unit apartment building tied here. We have another, other companies that are in here. And you talk about contingency plans and, and this is what I mean about business. So yeah, we're here renting, but all the other things pay for all of our overhead. Like we have no overhead at housing. And if that went bad, the contingency plan is it's housing. I could rent it out to people yep. so, or, and the third is I could sell it because we don't owe much on it. So there's always the three contingency plans to, to either get out of something, to have something cover something else. And, and so many business, I don't know what the stats are of how many businesses fail under five years and how many fail under 10. Yeah. But the reason is because they don't have contingency plans and they don't have a vantage point and they don't have a strategy. It's a, it's a multi-level thinking. It's not just like, I know so many people that start businesses, they don't even know what money they could make because they haven't even thought about, can I even scale this? Right. Like, yeah. And they spend all this time, 10 years, and then some, they talk to someone like either you or Satama or someone that's, that's good in business and they go, shit, this isn't even a scalable business. I just spent my whole life <laughs> figuring out I can make 50 grand a year. Yeah, right. right? School doesn't teach us stuff. No, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just putting all eggs in one basket and uh, not a great business strategy by yeah. any means. So I love it. And the other thing you said was, um, you know, maybe during those low times when things are a little bit tight, uh, you cut your pay first, right? And yeah. I know you, in our, in, our, in our messaging group that we have together, you know, you talked about leaders eating last and that's really just that mentality, right? It's, you know, yeah you're the leader of this company, like you're going to take, you're going to take the biggest sacrifices, you know, you're going to keep your troops fed, make, and then uh, when times get good again, you're going to make sure that they get a, they, they get that back, which is uh, powerful too, because that's, that's, that is uncommon for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. No, and, and, and that's how we live. Like I'm, I'm, you know, we're approaching a decent sized company here and I still, do some of the same work that my team does, meaning dealing with the public. And I said, even if it's only one or two people a month, I'm going to continue to stay in that fight. Yeah. There is nothing like, you know, you can give advice to people and not be in the game. And, you know, you know it's like coaching, you know, Bill Belichick, he, I don't think he ever played football, but he's still a hell of a coach. Yeah. I'm not saying that's not, the, that's definitely viable. You can definitely have a leader that's not in the mix with you. But for me, I, and, and all my people love this because guess what? They can't tell me anything that, I, that I, I'm experiencing it with them. So I'm in the trenches with them generating business. I'm out there helping them make sales calls. I'm leading by example. Yep. And I don't think I'll ever change that. Yeah. I think I'll stay in the trenches. I might just do less of it. Yeah. And it gives you such insight to the market. It gives you really what is really going on. And, and yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, you keep your finger on the pulse, number one. Number two, you can, uh, that leading by example is extremely important, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, so that's incredible that you do that. You know, like in the leadership, when, you know, if you're the first one to jump on a grenade and people see it, yeah, surprised, you'll be surprised how many people try and throw you out of the way to jump on the grenade for you. Yeah, right. And Absolutely. And that's what it's talking about, sacrificing. You know, I don't ever ask anyone to sacrifice anything until I've done times four of sacrificing. Yeah. Uh, and then if your team member goes down, you know, we've had a few people that have had to have a bit out for a while, surgeries, they got kids, they got families. You know, we yeah, you stepped up and we pay them. That does not happen. Right. And it's yeah. all about the planning and the strategy and having cash reserves so that, you know, and I circle this back, like the Navy SEALs talking to Goggins, the, the elite forces. Yeah. When one of those guys goes down, they don't leave them there. Right. They fight, they grab the person, they take them with them and they get healed and then they come back. And it's the same thing. If one of our guys gets sick, we're going to, we're going to continue to fight and we're going to wait sure they're healed. We're going to make sure the family gets their bills paid. And you can only do that if you've had the strategy years and years before. Yep. 
Man, that's incredible. I love it, man. That's a, that's a true testament to you and, and your leadership, tr- championship level leadership. Uh, let's wrap this up with one last question. What what was uh, what what is something that you could leave our listeners with? Um, you know, what what one piece of advice talking about leadership, leading the team, uh, yeah. whether that's family or business or whatever whatever area of life that might be. What what's, what's one or two things you could leave our audience with here today? Here's, here's one of the best things that I've heard lately that I've, I've really started to adopt, uh, adopt. And it's going to sound counterintuitive to what this statement really means. So when I say I'm surrendering the outcome, a lot of people will think that of as, oh, he's given up. He doesn't care. Yeah. What that really means is most people won't take chances, won't work on their relationship, won't get physically fit because they're worried about failure. And they won't surrender the outcome. They're scared to spend the money. They're scared to do the extra things. Um, Or they're they're scared that they'll work out and they just won't lose any weight and it'll be too hard. So my advice to all all of your listeners and everything that you do right now is surrender the outcome. And what that means is take chances. Go all in. Let your ego go. You know, in a relationship, again, I'm not an expert at this, but I'm, I'm practicing it more. Don't fight over something silly, whether it's doing the dishes or whatever, or taking your kids somewhere, or you got to pick something up at the grocery store. Just do it. Yeah. Get out of your own way. And with business, everything, surrender the outcome, take chances, keep moving forward. Don't stop because if you have five losses, the win will come at some point. And that's, that's one of my favorite things that I've been, um, been thinking about lately and been doing and talking to people about surrender the outcome. I love it. Yeah. I mean, what I hear that is, is really don't focus on the outcome as much and just uh, commit to the process and really have faith in you and your abilities. And, and you know that if you do what's required, like yeah. the outcome is going to take care of itself, basically. Yeah, but you have to commit and surrender to that. So you know, you, that, yeah. what if you fall short of losing 20 pounds and you lost 17? Yeah. Did you fail? I don't, you know. Yeah. What if, you, what if you try to run a hundred miles like me and you only make 64 the first time and 75 or six the next? Well, you got to get all 200 miles, man. <laughs> you got to get all 200 this time. You yeah, get- I am. I am. I'm, I'm committed to that. And I, uh, I have the right mindset and, and I've set myself up with that because of all these, the experiences of, of surrendering, I think to the outcome. So yeah, I uh, can't wait. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Love you for being on here. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, It's been an honor, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir.